welcome everyone to our weekly meetings. Uh, today, our speaker is Professor Michael Geller from University of Georgia. Uh, so, uh, Professor Geller is a group leader at the Department of Physics and Astronomy, and uh, I uh, like went through his Google Scholar page today, and his uh, research interests span like a super diverse range of topics. Uh, including some problems from like condensed matter physics of superconducting qubits in the context of quantum devices, but also quantum chemistry, even astrophysics, or like I saw even one paper from particle physics. Uh, That's, a one. <laughs> That's a one. Yeah. So, uh, like about the naturalness of Higgs boson uh, of Higgs mass, is the, uh, that's not you? Okay, so it's on your Google Scholar page, but I suspect that this is like too much. <laughs> and another Michael Yellow, I guess. Awesome. Uh, right. So, but uh, so uh, the one which is you, and I am sure about that, uh, like uh, does research uh, recent research in the uh, characterization of state preparation and measurement errors. Uh, and so that's what Professor Geller is gonna uh, tell about uh, tell about today. Uh, so please, Michael, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks. All. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks, uh, Philippe, for uh, inviting me, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, you know coming to this uh, seminar. Um, no, my background is in condensed matter theory, actually strongly correlated systems, quantum Hall effect, this kind of stuff, and then. In the early 2000s, when the very first superconducting qubits were being made, I got very interested in superconducting qubit, kind of the design. And so I worked for a long time on, I would say, hardware, hardware components of quantum computing, how to design superconducting qubits, how to do gates, how to do tunable couplers, <coughs> issues like that. Um, so, and then more, and then more recently, um, when the online systems started becoming available, that was just very intriguing to me. You know, if you're if, if you're a theorist working in the early days of quantum computing, you just fantasize about the day you'll do like single, you know, C naught that is, has fidelity better than ninety percent. And uh, so it's kind of irresistible to me to actually use these quantum computers. Turning that into a research subject is very challenging. And I'm not even sure <laughs> I've done it successfully yet. One of the things that I realized that one should, and you know, I wrote lots of proposals very early on to do uh, you know, various projects um, with online quantum computers and reviewers said, you know, I don't even know if you can get a PhD, you know, doing this topic. And, and it's actually true. I think it's a legitimate issue because at, at least, you know, a couple of years back, mainstream quantum computing theorists kind of viewed these early devices as, as a little bit of a gimmick in a way. But it's really gone past that now. It's it's a huge field now. The, the technology is getting better. I still find it interesting to use it, although I'm really trying to like wind down those projects and move on to other things. Um, but I, you know, the, the, but the question still remains: what 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 can you do? Can you do science? Can you do science with these quantum computers that you can? you know, maybe have four qubits acting coherently or something like that. And one of the, so I, I think there's a question mark there, but one of the things I think where you can do science is, is in studying the errors and all the non-ideality because the errors are very large and the characterization of errors and how we model errors in quantum computing, especially in the context of fault tolerant quantum computing, it's, it's, a, it's a very rich subject. And that's kind of how I got pulled into this, actually. So, so what I'm going to talk, be talking about today is, is uh, spam errors, state preparation and measurement errors, mostly on measurement errors, and mostly focusing on um, these two papers here. And um, what I'm going to do is start by giving you a, a little history of uh, a family of techniques that has been used for over 10 years in the experimental community. It's something they were not really talking about 
publicly very much. It, like if you look at these early papers using this technique, and I'm gonna call the technique T matrix error mitigation. Um, there's no like accepted uniform term for this. Um, this is being like the back of the supplementary information. It's like, you know, usually theorists don't even look back there and these details are back. And, and I needed to understand this because I was doing very, some you know, very early um, online computations and the measurement errors are massive. So, I mean, they're not as bad today. They're still large. They're still the largest error, single error source in the quantum computer. But um, they, you know, in those days, they were like 10% errors, just massive. And you had, to, you had to address it using techniques like this. So I started reading about that and then started thinking about it like from a quantum measurement perspective, you know, what are we really doing here? Is this really meaningful? Is it rigorous and so on and so forth? So let me just first introduce the technique and just say what people have been doing. And then we'll talk about kind of the justification. So, so the idea is that you have a non-ideal, both non-ideal state preparation, then non-ideal gates. To, I mean, everything's non-ideal. Um, and then the readout. And the, the, there's a, this, this TMEM technique is what you would do is you would take an empty register. You, you would take a set of qubits um, and you prepare them in all the possible classical states. And then you apply no gates and you just measure. And what you would get ideally is if I call the classical states X, you would put some initial state X prime in and you would act with identity, you get the same X out. But in fact, because of errors, you don't, the, the classical states you input are not the classical states you output. For a classical state that's input, there's a distribution of classical states that are output. And this is characterized by a transition matrix. So what you do is, is for all classical inputs, you measure probability distributions on the output, and then you measure this transition matrix, which you can think of as is the probability of observing classical state X after preparing X prime. And that notation is, is useful, and it, I, it captures the essence of the TMEM technique, although it's important to point out that X prime is not, I mean, the X and X primes are not ideal. I mean, you, when I say, like this notation sort of assumes that you're preparing an exact state X prime, which is not true. You're preparing a noisy one. And then when you're measuring it, you're not measuring the intrinsic probability distribution. You're measuring it with respect to a, a, so a POVM, measurement operators that are not ideal. Now, so if, but if everything is ideal, this transition matrix is the identity matrix. The classical state you put in, is the classical state you get out. This T is a identity matrix. And the simplest form of error correction is just to take raw noisy data and apply the T inverse. Inverse that mate, invert that matrix. Think of P as a vector, invert the matrix, and you get the correction that way. This is what people were doing. So, and this is the simplest kind of version. There's better ways to do this. There's you know, issues having to do with um, whether this correction will actually be physical. And that depends on this T. There's questions about whether you can invert the T. Um, those are, those kinds of questions are simpler to answer. I'm not gonna focus on those. I'll just say that there's better ways to do this and people know those better ways. And you guys, I think yourselves know the better ways. What I wanna talk about are two kind of bigger issues with this technique. So one of them is, is the rigorous aspect. Like, is this from a quantum measurement perspective, does this really correct the POVMs? Is this, it seems reasonable thing to do. If like, one of the ways I like to think about what you're doing with this technique is after you apply T inverse, you are enforcing a condition that, that this empty quantum computer acts as a perfect channel where the, the input classical states are, are 
are, are, are perfectly measured on the output. It cleans up it cleans up the quantum computer in the channel sense. <coughs> um, and so it seems like a pretty, you know, from that point of view, it seems like a justified thing to do. And, you know, the experimental community, I think, you know, sometimes just had that view in mind that, oh, this is just part of, you know, calibrating the equipment and it doesn't really need to be discussed. Um, but we, you know, know now that it's more complicated than that. So there's this rigorous aspect I'm going to talk about, and then there's a scalability aspect. And the scalability aspect is this requires preparing two to the n initial states and carrying around two to the n by two to the n matrices. It's clearly not scalable. And just interrupt, please, if there's questions. I'm happy to be interrupted. So I want to talk. Uh, so before I talk about the techniques, I, you know, one of the questions that comes up is like, you know, how how, bi how big are the errors, and then also how large are their correlations. So there's different ways to measure errors, and for for a single qubit, there's a very simple uh, error measure. It's a spam error measure. It's really measuring both state preparation and measurement error, and in the T matrix language, you're taking the average of the two off diagonal components. And this is called epsilon. IBM uses this. And um, so if I look on a Melbourne chip, the average epsilon on a four or eight qubit register is like 5% or 8%. So it's, it's, still, it's still big. Melbourne is not in the newest family of chips. There are ones the, the newest chips are now have smaller errors, but uh, they're still significant. And um, this, this is a symmetrized, so, so spam error, well, let's say measurement errors are asymmetric in the sense that there's a bigger chance of measuring, calling a one a zero as opposed to calling a zero or a one is, is a kind of an asymmetry between a kind of bit flip asymmetry. Um, this epsilon just takes a symmetry, it's a symmetrized measure, just taking an average, but it's still useful, people like to use it. So now going beyond a single qubit, um, a very natural- um, uh, Sorry, can I ask something about this last point? So yeah. you, uh, you mentioned, because uh, okay, like, as you mentioned, we like in in, uh, in our group, we also studied uh, those spam errors, and, uh, and this is one of the things that we do. But what always sort of bothered me, I mean, like I come, like we come from quantum information or mathematical physics community, so we don't have really like physical understanding of uh, physical processes that underneath that are underneath the, the let's say in particular measurement process. So is there some let's say intuitive explanation for this asymmetry? That's yes. Okay. So the um, asymmetry, yes. So the ace, it is specific to the hardware and I can tell you what it is for superconducting qubits, which is the case that I know. So in the case of superconducting qubits, the, the, what, what, the, the way that this, the qubits are measured is the, the qubit that you're me measuring is prepared in some superposition of zero and one, and then it's brought into a, it's strongly detuned with another, re, with a resonator, a harmonic oscillator, who, whose frequency gets slightly shifted by the quantum state of the qubit. And it will shift the frequency just up or down by a little tiny bit. And then you're measuring that frequency shift in the second qubit. But it takes a few hundred nanoseconds to do it. And while you're doing, this is called dispersive measurement. While you're doing that, the qubit can decay. And that's the main error is, is a, one, a, a state that was, should be a one gets called a zero because it decayed during the measurement process. So that's a big effect. That's easily, that's you know, five, six, 7% effect right, you know, right now. The, the, there is a push to do the dispersive readout faster, um, which would make that error smaller. Um, and then there's the question of, okay, what about reverse? How does a zero state get measured as a one? That's a very interesting case. Quite, that's a more that's a trickier case, and it turns out, and we this is something that 
you know, I only learned very recently, and I'll touch on this later in the work, that it turns out to be state preparation error. The intrinsic POVM errors do not make that mistake. It, that, it, they might make it at a 10 to the minus three or 10 to the minus four level. But, it, but if when in the T matrix, <coughs> if I look at the element prepare zero and measure one, this element here, um, that is caused by the fact that your zero state has about a one to one and a half percent one in it. It's a bad state preparation. It's a good question. Okay, so so coming so now uh, on the uh, multi qubit case. So we want we want to have like just simple ways to be to talk about um, the size of errors in a multi qubit uh, register, and a very natural one is to just look at a norm matrix norm of the measured T matrix minus its ideal, which is the identity matrix. And so um, this is, uh, we, li we like to do this. Uh, we like to use, so, you, so uh, people have been using Frobenius norm for this. Um, <clears throat> a weakness of using Frobenius norm is that if I wanna compare errors across registers of different sizes, I don't really know how to do that because I don't sort of have a way to like scale. I don't, uh, have some like a baseline scaling of how the Frobenius norm would be expected to change. Just because it's big, not because the errors are getting bigger, just because there's more qubits. Um, there's, so if, but if you rescale the Frobenius norm by the square root of the matrix dimension, like here, then you can show that in the limit of small errors and lots of qubits, that if I take a symmetric single qubit T matrix that <clears throat> this rescaled norm has a linear scaling in number of qubits n times the same epsilon. And this just, this just is, is a convenient way to allow you to compare across different registers. It also gives you a way, one indication about correlations because this result here applies to a to a multi-qubit T matrix, which is a tensor product of single qubit T matrices that ignores correlations. So this is kind of an uncorrelated like baseline result. And so we can do this on, um, so, okay, so, so, so we use this, this rescaled Frobenius norm. And then another norm that's good to use is just the max norm where you just look at the largest element. And that just shows you the single largest error. And it's kind of striking how big it is. Because like here, so this is a four and eight qubit register. Those registers are in Melbourne. They're circled in these, these col colored lines down here. This T measured, this is the measured T matrix minus the identity max norm, 34, 35% error, 67% error. These are huge, huge errors. So um, it, this is, it's, a, it's, very, it's a very challenging problem. And I mean, in some ways, I kind of find it intriguing to try to actually develop error mitigation techniques that work when the errors are so huge because you really, I mean, you really have to get, you really have to get it right. So uh, by the way, is this like T for eight qubits uh, measured like assuming uh, uh, full correlations or is it like with some tensor structure here? No, full correlations. That's okay. just a mm -hmm. directly measured one. Thank you. And, sure. and here's an example. This is kind of the biggest one I can show. It's three qubits. And it's useful just also just to look at the, look at the numbers and, and see, okay, well, the diagonals are definitely not great. They should be one. There should be no off diagonal elements. And you can see that, you know, there's some big errors here. Like, look, this, there's a 40% error for the zero, zero, zero going to zero, one, zero. Now this, in fact, is an example of a of a correlated error. It's a multi-qubit error, and this is we're going to talk. I'll be talking about this late, later in the talk. Okay, so the first thing that to to address that I want to talk about is just how to think about this technique from a rigorous perspective. How to think about what it's really doing. How to justify it, and 
as far as I know, you, uh, your paper is the first one that 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 I know of that really like investigated this from this perspective of just you know fundamental measurement theory. Um, we, and it's you know it's kind of interesting that it took so long for people to do this, and um, and so I'm going to frame. So I, I did this also recently in this quantum science technology paper, and um, one can prove a theorem that <coughs> that that tells you when such error correction technique could be possible. So the idea is that if I take a a non-ideal measurement, non-ideal PLVM, this is equivalent to an ideal measurement followed by a classical Markov process, a Markov process acting on the uh, classical probabilities. And this will be true, um, this, is, this is true if the POVMs are diagonal in the classical basis. You, it's kind of, you can call it like a classical, it's a, it's a kind of a classical noise. And so, so then we can ask, so in this, so in this, so in this setting, um, you can, you can, you can treat the non-idealities as a classical Markov process gamma. And then if I measure gamma and invert it, in principle, I can correct the error. That's the way that I think about it. And so then the question is, um, you know, how, you know, to, how, how do you actually, uh, you know, make this work in practice? So first of all, we have to know whether the, the measurement error is the, of this classical type. And for um, a single qubit, this can be answered with gate set tomography. So uh, we just, in this paper, <coughs> I simply measured, I mean, Gate set tomography has its own, you know, set of issues. But if you just accept gate set tomography, accept the results of gate set tomography, it shows very small off-diagonal elements in the POVM, like it's ten to the minus three level. Oh, in, on a single qubit, by the way, those errors correspond to doing a measurement. You're trying to do a measurement in a Z basis, but it's a little bit tilted, with a like ten to the minus three, you know, error in the tilt. Okay, so very small, and that is consistent with this picture that I was talking about that you're just getting T1 relaxations in the readout. Now, in a multi, in the multi-qubit case, we really don't know that it's still diagonal. And that I would say is an open problem. And there's different ways that one might approach that problem. You could try to do multi-qubit gate set tomography. That's very hard to do. You might do it on pairs of qubits, but probably not beyond that. But I think. I, I don't think it's actually, a, I, I think it's a fairly easy problem to solve. It's a kind of a tomography problem to solve and someone needs to do that. Really measure measure the um, uh, off diagonal elements, the POVMs in a multi-qubit uh, context. And the, the only like kind of critical thing in that is that it, that is gonna, because the errors are so small, your initial, your prepared states are going to have to be perfect, because what you're basically going to want to like prepare, you're going to want to, you know, prepare states of a qubit number one, and then in qubit number two, you're going to do a measurement in the x basis. You'll like do a Hadamard, okay? And then if you get, and then you'll see any um, <coughs> that that that'll measuring in the x basis will just turn that into z basis measurement. Well, it effectively turns it the basis measurement and you'll be able to measure off diagonal components, but you have to make sure that that initial state was perfect. But I'll, I'll show you that that's actually not very hard to do um, with GST. So that, that will be, that'll come later. So okay. if, uh, uh, if I may uh, bump in, so do you mm -hmm. think that, uh, because you have said that uh, in your opinion, it is like kind of an easy problem in the sense of tomography, right? But uh, so do you think that the GST can be like, you know, some, uh, I don't know, a variation on this can be scaled like for more than two qubits on those uh, measurement operators? Because 
like as far as I saw what people do, it requires like super a lot of resources, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, if if it, this cannot be scaled, then you will always, uh, I suspect, have this problem with the standard tomography, right? Uh, like uh, because uh, when you do when you do just some type of detector tomography on uh, on a few qubits or something, then you must assume the uh, perfect state preparation, as you said. Like so, I I can also just comment uh, that uh, we actually uh, in that paper we checked uh, like for two qubits if they are still uh, diagonal and they were like highly still diagonal. But this is under this assumption of perfect state preparation. Is this in uh, your your newest paper? Uh, no, in, the, in this uh, old one, uh, be, like paper? because we uh, this uh, you have on this slide. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, yes. but you did, I see you did that with uh, with with non ideal states. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, like, so just going back to my question, like, what uh, what do you think about like uh, scalability of this uh, of this like uh, state preparation robust I think, method? I think you can't because mm -hmm. I, I would look at it like this. Imagine doing GST where the gate set consists of only state preparation and measurement and no gates. It's kind of, it's kind of like, I, I think it should be possible, but you would have to, so it, you would be combining some techniques because you would do traditional GST with gates to characterize, because we're gonna see later, the, the way to prepare perfect states is by doing single qubit GHZ to learn how this, how imperfect the states you prepare are. And then you make linear combinations of those that are perfect. So mm -hmm. you would do that so you learn how to prepare the perfect states. And then I guess maybe you would have to assume that the basis transformation, the Hadamards were perfect. Hadamards, so, so I guess it depends on the, the level of rigor and precision that mm -hmm. you need. I think, you know, I, I, th I think one can do this in a practical way. Right. And, uh, but and, unfortunately, and, I think that you would, uh, in this way, you would need to assume the, like no crosstalk between uh, gates later, right? Or... <laughs> no crosstalk between mm -hmm. uh, the prepared Sing single. Three, yeah, right? exactly. That's right. Only crosstalk. Only, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And 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 yeah, maybe that maybe that's actually bad. Maybe, yeah. I guess the best you can really probably hope for is kind of putting limits on, you know, how non-classical the POVM is. Maybe that's the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Sure. Fine. Okay. Um, so, so the way that. Um, we can, okay, so so in this language of, so we have this language of, we started to talk about T matrices, and then I said, oh, in this other setting, we call this gamma, and um, gamma represents this Markov process associated with just classical non-ideal POVMs here. And so in, in, in our language, we're going to have two, T matrix, transition matrix like quantities, the T matrix that we've talked about previously, and then a new one called gamma, which is the one that you would use to do this rigorously, okay? So the T matrix is defined as you prepare a non-ideal state rho x prime, and then measure a noisy POVM EX. The gamma matrix, has the ideal state prepared and then the noisy POVM, okay? That's the difference between gamma and T. And the way you, the, the way that you, so we have a way to calculate T by, this is basically what you would call a, pro, a quasi probability decomposition. You, you introduce a basis of projectors uh, 0, 1, plus and plus i for corresponding to those states. And these form a complete basis for uh, single qubit density matrices. And then what you do is you prepare non-ideal versions of those four states called rho, lambda, rho, rho 0, 1, plus, plus i. And you, me you measure those by GST, 
and you project them in this pi basis and get these coefficients L. And this gives you a co this gives you a linear relation between these ideal projectors and the noisy states. And then by inverting this relationship, you can find gamma in terms of things that you can measure directly, which is expectation values of the measurement in these noisy states. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Okay. So my question is like, do you have then a guarantee? Because like just looking on the formula for, for gamma, it should be like a conditional pro, uh, probability distribution, right? In, in principle, right? Uh, so if it you do this, like a, uh, a, a stochastic matrix, are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, is uh, that so? Yeah, so that's uh, so then when you do this uh, G, uh, GSC and you have this formula for, for gamma, so you might uh, so it won't be exactly a stochastic matrix. I, so, what you do imagine. that's a great question. And so, what you do, what I do is I find the I find the stochastic gamma that is closest to this quantity in a least square sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I have also a small uh, uh, like question related to this GST because I understand that you need to do this on each qubit like separately in this uh, picture. Right. And then like so because I like I know just the basics of gate set tomography, but uh, uh, normally you have this gauge freedom, right? Uh, and in uh, like, and in, in, if you do a single qubit stuff, then probably it doesn't matter. But then I imagine that if you want to like connect uh, results of different GSTs for a uh, joint system, then this, uh, this will matter, I, I suspect, right? So, or... it, so I, I would okay. say, different. so the gauge, so the gauge mm -hmm. freedom is comes up if I want to separate an error into a state preparation and a measurement part. So what you measure is the combination of initial states, possibly a channel, and then the measured thing. That's the, the physical thing. And then if I divide it and say, this part of the error is measurement error, this part of state error, that is, that is where the gauge issue comes up. And so even on a single qubit level, the gauge question is important. And I just taking the approach to trust GST on this and accept that you know this is something, this is a this is a an issue. I don't I don't necessarily call it a I don't know if I would call it a weakness of GHT. I would because it's it's a fu it's fundamentally there in any type of tomography. It's not like it's not like something that can be corrected with the GST. The question is how you deal with it. And G what G the way GST deals it with it now is they fit, they do a fit of your, of your model, the, your total model of initial state, gates, and POVM. They do a best fit to your targets. And that's how mm -hmm. they choose the gauge. So you could say that GAC, like from a rigorous perspective, GHD, GHZ, uh, G GST is giving you a best case answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now there. Now then there. You can we. You know we can ask. Well, okay. Um, wh what if you know? It, is that a sensible thing to do? What they do. What they're doing. And I think the answer. And I've explored this quite a bit. And I'm not an expert at GST. And I, you know, have been hearing that the GST experts are also doing related things and I'm happy to let them do it. But I've done, I've done studies where I've simulated the whole GST process where I introduce non-ideal gates, I measure them, feed them through GST and see how GST, how well GST is at discovering my gates, just a pure simulation. And um, when the errors in the gates are kind of similar, of so similar size, that works well, but you could imagine high asymmetry. Measurement errors are much worse than the other errors. Then I would not necessarily trust that technique. And then you might need to change it. I think this is kind of a, a question at the forefront of GST, but, but the issue, Philip, is both 
at the single qubit level and the multi qubit level at that gauge mm -hmm. comes in. Okay. So, okay. Michael, if I understand well, because, okay, I I don't know GST that, uh, that well, at least for now. So, so are you sort of implying that it can underestimate the errors or in practice it underestimate it can under underestimate yeah, the errors underestimate in the presence of huge asymmetry between states and okay but then it's a bit uh, okay like if one takes rigorous point of view one would actually go for the worst case scenario as opposed yeah. to the best That's case right. scenario right right yeah the, okay. so so in fact what what i the way I talk about this is I talk about this as being conditionally rigorous. It's conditioned on trusting GST. And also there's another assumption, which is that the initial states that are prepared are not entangled. Suppose I'm, when I prepare my classical states, there's, I, you know, I, I, they might be mixed, they are mixed. But what if I actually prepare entangled states when I didn't mean to, that I will not, that, that it will uh, slip through this whole procedure. So it's conditioned on those things. Mm -hmm. And okay. like just, just a one slight thing, like sure. sorry, but this is uh, super no, no, interesting. <laughs> uh, like, so just to understand, uh, like when you do this GST, uh, so what this, uh, because I, uh, I saw that you probably are uh, like, uh, using this pi gst module right like i saw this that it, that it's available uh, but the question is uh like uh when you do this uh um uh, fitting to this best case so how it uh, somehow translates onto the separation between state preparation and measurements this is like which i didn't get maybe well uh, that is internal mm -hmm. to gst what gst mm -hmm. does is gst takes a list of these experience it it produces a clever list of, of experiments, each one involving preparation of like a zero state typically, and then application of one out of a small set of gates, like a pi over two X and Y rotation is what I'm using, um, and, then, and then measurement. And then it builds these lists of gate sequences that amplify the errors. That, that's probably like the real meat of GSP is how you choose those gate, those gate sequences in a, the, a smart way. And then you take those and then you do a best fit to a global like best fit to a model. And, and the, um, that, that's, where, that's, where the, that's where the GS, that's where the gauge choice is, is coming in. So it, it's, it comes in before, you know, already when you're receiving the output of GSD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that makes sense, yeah. Thank you. So here's some examples of the the importance, or you know how how, how you know how significant is doing rigorous measurement correction versus just T matrix. So so here's um, some Merman polynomials. This is sim similar to like an entanglement measurement. Um, it's it's a uh, violates um, local realism in variables. So here's the M three and four qubit Merman polynomial, um, and we're measuring the values of a, 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 a sum of of poly expectation values. Local realism has some limit two and four. Ideal quantum mechanics has uh, four and eleven point something. On raw data, um, we'll get three point six. 8.7 here. T matrix corrects this all, all the way up to the ideal value practically. That, that right there is an indication that something is wrong because this there's some C not gates here that are not being corrected and the C not gates certainly have errors. So that, that, that's unphysical. And then when you use the gamma matrix instead of the T matrix, this pushes it down kind of in between those two numbers. And so I think of the, I don't think of the, the kind of rigorous T matrix method, something you need to use all the time. It, I think there's a lot of times when this, the, the, these errors don't matter. I think it matters when you're doing high precision measurement or like foundational quantum mechanics stuff where 
you know, everything like, you know, bail violation, these kinds of things, entanglement measurement, things where you are, you know, you have some fundamental principles that you're uh, exploring and you're not allowed to just go do things to the data without justification. So that's how I, I look at this as kind of for more special case, more special cases. And, and it's complicated to do. You have to do GST on, on you know, the single qubits. You don't necessarily, I mean, that, the, it, for this experiment, doing the GST was much more complicated than measuring the Merman polynomial. So there, there's a, just the overhead and the complexity of running these experiments. Okay, so, so now I want to turn to the question of scalability. And the, that is connected with the fact, with, with the question of how correlated are the errors? Because if the errors are not correlated between qubits, you just use a, a, a product, tensor product of T matrices or gamma matrices and you're done. So I wanna just first just explore how big these errors are. And this is a four qubit and eight qubit uh, register on Melbourne, the same register as I'm showing here. And, and then we're gonna look at just a, multi, a, a directly measured T matrix that has all the correlations in minus a product approximation. And, but there's different ways to define the single qubit T matrices in this situation. For example, so if I have a qubit, if I have a register of four qubits and I want the T matrix for qubit one, what do I do with the other qubits? Do I just set the, their initial states to zero um, or, or, so, or something else? And, and, it, and since those, the systems are coupled, the, the answers matter. It doesn't matter a lot, but we did want to explore this effect. And, um, and, but the conclusion in the end is that the correlations are large. You can really see this in max norm that this is now the difference between a, a, a multi-qubit T matrix and a product approximation five per, you know, has some particular errors that are as large as 5% in both of these cases. Um, so that tells me that on this chip, the correlations are significant and you can't just ignore them. So, so, the, so there's now, so we, we've, we worked on this problem for a few years actually, um, and had a lot of, you know, a lot of dead end, you know, approaches. I mean, the idea was always very simple. The idea is that the T, this, the T matrix method does not make use of this tensor product structure at all. And if you think about the system physically, you've got qubits, they're interacting electromagnetically, it's mainly a pairwise interaction. And so if you think, if you think about the correlations as being dominated by pair correlations, you should be able to get a scalable um, technique because you just have to measure pair correlations, which means you're doing measurements on pairs of qubits, which is a n squared uh, sample complexity. And, you know, we tried that and it didn't work. And then we said, oh, well, there must be three qubit correlations. We tried that, it didn't work. Oh, there must be four qubit correlations. In the end, what we found is that the, the, the issues is actually more complicated. There's actually, there, the, Q, the correlations are few body, but they're more than one type. And in this paper, we call these A type and B type and C type. And I'm not gonna ex explain all that because it gets very technical and it's explained in detail in the paper, but the framework, the framework that we're using is thinking about this from a mean field kind of perspective where the T matrix I view as a, as a expectation value of the POVM elements, single qubit POVM elements. And then you look at, you look at, average values of the POVMs, which are related to the single qubit T matrices. And then you look at their fluctuations and you just expand this in powers of the fluctuation. Okay, now I'm gonna have to um, just pause for a second here. Um, give me about 30 seconds, okay? Sure, I'm gonna no, stop no worries. And I'll, and I'll join you in a second. Of course.
Um, the issue is I'm giving an exam right now to 200 students and I need to post it. <laughs> I see. Okay. Seems to take it. Okay. So, what do you teach? Like uh, some undergrad physics? I'm teaching. So, this is an undergraduate physics. Okay, that seemed to, to take it fine. I can uh, join you again. Um, so, I, I'm teaching graduate quantum physics now. And um, I'm teaching uh, e &M, intro e &M, to you know lot tons of students. And yeah, the pandemic has made that a complete mess. The gra the graduate course. Do you guys teach, uh, Michael? A bit. You? Yes. 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 Um, Professors teach. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, it's it's a it's a mess. <laughs> Of course. Yeah. So, um, so, so yeah, so, so, so this technique, this technique, um, it, it work, it, it's, it's highly accurate. It's complicated. It's complicated. It's highly accurate. The the, what the, the punchline is, is it, it's, it's scale. Well, okay. I want to be careful to say this is like towards a scalable method. This is not fully scalable. The number of circuits you have to measure is polynomial. It's n squared times two to the k. The n squared comes because it's these pairs. The two to the k comes because of this other, another family of these a and b type correlators, which you have to account for. And what that k is, k is the number of qubits in some, cor so, uh, some correlation region. So, and right now k is, is, is large. So on the Melbourne chip, k included all of the qubits. So, but eventually when systems get large enough and the noise gets weak enough, there should be a finite volume of correlated region and that determines this K and then this becomes a, an efficient, well, it becomes the sample complexity is, is, is efficient. The, the, um, but the number of samples, measurement samples is still exponential. Um, now in terms of, of other methods, so there's a couple of other methods around. So IBM has one that came out at, so, so I was saying we, we worked on this for a couple of years. Then when we started trying to publish it, um, reviewers were like, oh, error correlations are not important. This is, you know, this is like very complicated for a very small effect. Um, but in the meantime, you know, other groups started doing similar things, including you guys. And, and you know, lots of papers are really talking about error correlations. Now people realize it, it's, it is a big and important effect. Um, and so these are, you know, there's other papers coming out which have some benefits relative to ours um, and also weaknesses. I think ours probably right now is the most accurate, but it's also the most complicated and you kind of have to decide, you know, what, what you want. I would say right now, I don't know of a method that is completely scalable, fully scalable from end to end. Okay, um, yes, here's some of the related papers. Um, Ravi, this is the IBM paper. Um, they have one. The thing I most like about the IBM approach is they avoid the T matrix inversion step because of their, the way they define their model. That's very clever. Um, so let's just look at how this how this works. Um, so here's uh, a, again a three qubit example and. <clears throat> The upper T matrix is the directly measured one. The lower one is the estimated one according to this technique. And the, the, and the biggest, the, you know, point about a third of a percent error is the biggest difference. So it, wor it, works, it works very well. Um, 
but it's complicated and I'm, you know, I, I think there is definitely room for improving on this. And that is about all I needed to, wanted to say. I'll, um, I'll, 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 you know, mention a couple things that I think are interesting to be doing in the future. So one is to understand the spatial extent of error correlations. Um, and that, that's interesting to do on these new chips because the new IBM chips are very big. Um, in fact, I started doing that with somebody and we're just starting to look at the data. Um, the, uh, as uh, we were talking about doing a, some kind of tomography of the multi-qubit POVMs, I think that is a solvable problem. Um, one, it would be uh, very useful to extend the technique to work for a single sample instead of on a whole probability distribution. I think that's not hard to do at all. I, I think I would know exactly what to do. Um, Philip is saying, really? The, what you do is you calculate these probabilities and then you use those to sample. And it, it would be a Monte Carlo technique where the corrected probability distribution is used to determine whether or not you apply a given bit flip for a correction. And what, so the idea is that that would on, a, you, you, it would on average apply the, cor the correction that you would apply to the probability distribution. So, uh, right. So would this like kind of uh, be equivalent to applying some uh, stochastic process, which is supposed to reverse the noise, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, so I see. Yes. We, yeah. we were also thinking about stuff like this. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if it makes and, sense. You know, that, that, you know, definitely should be done. I think it's a good thing. Um, full scalability. Um, I, I mean, that might not be possible. I mean, well, I, I do think it's possible, you know, in some, context in some setting to make it scalable and, you know, accept some errors. Um, and I mean, our technique, it's very easy to see why the uh, measurement sample complexity is exponential. It's because you, you're adding the, an exponential number of random variables and the variances are just adding and there's just no way to get around that. Um, and then also, I think very interesting, and other people are now writing papers on this too, is a, a real integration with quantum error correction. And there's at least one or two papers now doing this because, I mean, it, make, it makes sense to do, right? Um, so, so that's the end, thank you. Ah, I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, uh, Michael. So uh, we have time for questions, uh, comments. Yeah. Does anyone want to say something? Right. So uh, I mean, I have a few questions, of course, but uh, uh, Michal, did you want to say something as well? Or oh, okay, I have just one mm -hmm. question like about this integration with quantum error correction. So, can you uh, elaborate a bit on, on, on like what okay. you mean exactly? Okay. Like so, so there's a couple of senses in which you could do this. So, one is like okay in you know, topological error correction, you have to have, use magic states and the magic state distillation is very expensive. What if you um, can reduce that overhead by doing, applying various error mitigation techniques on the gates? So that would be a ga example of, of gate error mitigation. For, for measurement, what about measurement? That in some sense, that is, a, I mean, that's kind of obvious. Okay, the measurement one is 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 not so obvious, and I'm and I it's not even clear that you can do it. It just seems like it should be possible. So so but you probably know, you would uh, need to uh, to involve the single sample correction for this. I, yeah, you would be single sample. So um, you would it would be a single and the idea is this. So how how are measurement errors dealt with right now with in in an error in fault tolerant context. Okay, what you do 
in what well, I mean this you know for surface codes and all kinds of things related to surface codes. What you do, you have the, the syndrome qubits and you measure them and the measurement errors are um, detected by repeating the syndrome measurements. So you might repeat them five times and take the majority vote. It's like repetition code in time in a way. And, um, and, you, and you just, and that now there's the, the, the surface code in particular is, is very robust to, to read out to, to measurement errors. Um, you can accept very large errors, um, but still you might say, well, you know, why not do something smarter like apply the single sample correction and you know, that, that that's gonna help you. I mean, I don't necessarily think it's, it's gonna like really change fault tolerant quantum com computation in like some serious way. But if you're gonna spend a billion dollars building a quantum computer, you might as well, you know, squeeze every little performance out of it. And, you know, it's, so it's, an, it's a natural thing to do. Sure, I agree, agree totally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, so are there any further questions? Uh... Uh, okay so, so i have ah, mm -hmm. so could you please go back to slide number eight did you say eight yeah yes so here uh, like a measurement error is classical marco process like what i know about marco process is that uh, memory um, it, it doesn't depend on memory so is there any classical version or quantum version or or like if you use, so can you first introduce what is quantum version and like what will be the case uh, if you use quantum version or why you're not using quantum Marco? Well, okay, uh, um, um, I might not be able to fully answer that question, but what I can answer is, is you know, precisely what I mean by this, the classical Markov process. And you know, so it's Markov because there's a, because there's a probability distribution here that gets multiplied by um, a stochastic matrix to make another one there. And it only depends on the state there. So that's why it's Markov. And it's obviously classical. Um, now, so that is, so, so, so are you asking why not somehow generalize this? It, it, are you asking, is there a way to generalize the Markov process so that I, this applies to any, any non-ideal POVM? So uh, what I know about Markov process is it is classical. Like, um, it, so I don't know about, is there any quantum Markov process? First, that is my first question. Or, or what do you mean um, by general Markov process? I, I think there's different, I mean, so, like in the in the like naive sense, not not really because quantum you know because of coherence. I mean, coherence is really uh, like you know yeah. I mean, coherence is really a non-Markov kind of thing. It depends. Well, I I don't know. I should be careful. I so I, I'll say I'll say it this way. I think there's different ways that you could define a quantum Markov process. In different settings and, and it would they would be cert, they would be extensions of the classical thing um but you know we don't need that here but if the question is like can you go beyond um correcting classical errors you can't do it in the simple way that i'm showing here but it, it's quite possible that you can and i think in your guys early paper it it was done in more generality than what I'm doing here. And it could be possible to correct. Um, I, I, I think I would not be surprised if there is an extension of the T matrix method where you, in, instead of just talking about zero and one states, you talk about zero, one plus and plus I or some, some other complete basis, which allows you to extend this to something that will correct any, any no, even a non-classical POVM, I, I would not be surprised if that's the case. 
yes, so I think like that the basic uh, assumption here is somehow that you can uh, actually think about like those platonic objects as in quantum mechanics that you have this POVM and the state and that you can somehow separate them, right? So yeah. like if you can do that, then it's... Uh, well, it doesn't really matter what is the uh, like uh, the ideal POVM. It can be classical. It can be anything. Like uh, if uh, there is still some stochastic process process which maps uh, your original POVM to the noisy one, then you can do something analogous to like this T matrix uh, uh, pro I think, I think uh, correction. So. Mm -hmm. I think so. That's, you, know, uh, some, you know, with some overhead, but. Um... And and so you know the simplest scenario is that, that it's found that the the errors really are highly classical at least on superconducting qubits. Now you know you go to a different architecture that might not be the case too. So there's certainly you know I could I you know probably I should put that on that list of future things. Actually extending past you know the classical POVMs is a, is a that's another good idea. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, okay, so uh, anyone else wants to ask something? Uh, okay, so I have uh, a few small questions. Uh, like, uh, so uh, one is technical one about this uh, results for Mermin polynomials. Uh, because uh, you observed, which is uh, very interesting, that this uh, standard T matrix is overestimating this stuff. And I yeah. was wondering whether this is like, uh, because normally when you correct using this method, then this uh, priority distribution can be non-physical and then you find like a projection onto the uh, probabilities, right? Like with respect to some norm. And uh, so is this after this projection or like, uh, right? Because th this is like, I also observed something uh, like such an effect that, uh, uh, that somehow puts you inside a very, uh, like very close to the ideal or even the ideal solution, yes. which is like kind of the artifact of this fact that you are projecting, right? So I what... mean, you, you can mm -hmm. say it's an artifact of the projection, but you can also say it's um, uh, an artifact of the fact that that the inverse the inverse of a stochastic matrix is not stochastic. Ah, th that's, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, that's of course true. How, however, like, you know, uh, I, uh, when you don't do this projection, then you can anyway formally like calculate those values, right? And then I suspect that uh, they would be lower in that case. Uh, oh, like that's so? just my intuition. I don't, uh, I, no, I would have guessed they'd be higher in fact. Ah, okay. So that's, uh, I, I'm not sure. I mean, because I mean, so yeah, I, I I don't know, but you know the fact that this is hitting four already, the maximum. Yes, of yes. This kind of indicates that. But. Uh, uh, yeah, abs that's uh, okay. Fair point. Uh, yes, but uh, maybe uh, I would say that it, uh, it would uh, could be quite different. That's maybe what I meant. Not yeah. necessarily uh, lower yeah. or uh, higher. Right. And uh, yeah. like what we did when we. Uh, uh, like up, uh, came across this, we kind of uh, said that uh, uh, you uh, you shouldn't like trust that much those results, and you can kind of measure the uh, the error that you make. Of course, this assumes that T matrix is exact, but uh, you can kind of calculate a distance from your original non-physical distribution to the new one, like which is after the projection. And this kind of upper bounds you the error that you do in the in some norm, right? So in this sense, uh, even if you uh, we, uh, if we got some like super no, uh, exact result, we also had those error bars that say like included this in a sense. Uh, so yeah, this is some uh, comment uh, which is uh, well, yeah, it doesn't solve yeah. the issue, but it just tells you that you shouldn't maybe trust this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I agree. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so uh, thanks. And like I have uh, one thing uh, still uh, to ask about like the estimation of this correlated measurement errors. Uh, like for example, when you shown those made uh, those errors for eight qubits, I saw this, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, my question would be uh, like when you have such a 
uh, such a big. Uh, so this is for uh, for how many qubits? This is probably for four. Uh, ah, here is for eight, right? Uh, uh, one of the results on the slide uh, twelve or uh, eleven. Uh, but this is for uh, for how many qubits? This is for three, right? Oh, eight. Okay. Eight. So yes. I meant those bigger ones, right? Like, okay, yeah, this. That, that's three qubits. This is three qubits, and I meant eight qubits. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like, oh. uh, um, so uh, because, qubits. yeah, uh, uh, because you said that you measure this eight qubit matrix directly, and of course it uh, like needs like you know over two hundred circuits, uh, but also when you estimate each of those uh, say columns of this T matrix, uh, then this has like super high sampling complexity on its own, right? Like uh, when you want to estimate the probability distribution itself, like it's, you also need a lot of repetitions. And uh, yeah. like, uh, so I was uh, like wondering basically how many samples did you, did you get yeah. to estimate and, this? Uh, and, so mm -hmm. let's see, I don't, I can look that up. I can't remember. So it's either eight thousand or or mm -hmm. thirty. Oh, it looks like in this paper I was doing thirty-two thousand samples. Yeah, so it's like four uh, repetitions probably yeah. or something. Uh, right. So I I uh, so I see. And this is like so. Do you suspect that maybe uh, this can cause some issues, right? Because uh, like you can have a if you do this big matrix this is probably why people also don't uh, like uh, this is one reason for why this naive method is not scalable right that you also have a high statistical noise in this in this matrix yeah so and, mm -hmm. and that's connected with the fact that if you just calculate the the error versus you bet you know bound the error versus a number of measurement samples you need exponential number mm -hmm. yeah yeah exactly and so uh, and this is like direct follow-up here on this slide exactly because uh you you were like uh, uh i remember even when you emailed that you are interpreting those results as that you have like this big correlation volume and i was like uh, kind of wondering uh whether like uh, because we also did some characterization and we found a no, uh, super like non-local correlations meaning that uh, long range qubits were talking to each other but they were not like uh, they were far away from the fully connected graph in a sense right so there were a lot of connections but not like uh, totally not a lot of them it was, this was like just a bunch of them and uh, like i was wondering uh, whether in this your method like uh, can you uh, can't you somehow just you know uh, disregard some relatively small correlations to make this volume lower like or something like this that's just just uh, a generic yeah, okay. question mm -hmm. so so there's a couple of uh, issues related to that so so um because of uh sampling noise um you're always going to measure long distance correlations at some small level yeah yeah exactly and, yeah so 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 i would be so so i would be wa want to focus and focus on the larger ones look at ones that are clearly larger than sampling errors and mm -hmm. it's um and it on a pair of qubits it's easy to estimate what those sampling errors are and um so and like in terms of numbers i remember a number like half a percent is is like typical so if you're measuring um non-local correlations that are larger than that that you know is probably significant but smaller than that probably not. or you can you i mean you'd have to just do more samples to really tease that mm -hmm. out but i would say that's maybe the not the less interesting part what was like surprising to me is that we get these these non-local correlations that are large there are several percent on on that chip on that chip we're doing it now on another chip uh, on other chips the newer chips and uh maybe you know it'll be smaller i i don't know mm -hmm. but so so yeah so now um so what you're i guess now you're talking about well let's try to make that correlation volume smaller 
could you do it by excluding uh, ones where that, uh, the, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's a good point. So what you're saying is that if you actually measure these correlation volumes like on the chip, then there's may only be, it, you know, it, it, there, there, you know, that number K might not include all of the qubits in some physical region. It may just be a select number of them that are larger. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good point. That, 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 that would help. That would help the, the technique. This is well, great. Okay, I, great. Uh, th thanks a lot. Uh, right, so I, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to uh, ask some questions still. Uh, Okay, so uh, I think we discussed quite a lot. Uh, yeah, thank and you. There, there were a lot of uh, questions. Thanks, so, Michael. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, so. Michael, for uh, for a yeah, nice talk. I